Welcome to a review of Talon Company using the ACCA CBE portal for strategic professional exams. This is question one from March, June 2019 paper and we're going to do part B. As you can see, we have a short introduction on the main section plus six exhibits on the left hand side plus the requirements. You'll also have two response options that are the word processor and spreadsheet, both of which we will use for this solution. After practicing these questions, you'll be familiar with your preferred placement on the screen, just as I'm doing right now. Firstly, copy the requirements to the relevant sections of your word processor to create some structure. Highlight the key parts of the requirements to ensure that you're answering all parts of the question. For part one, open the relevant exhibit and copy the information on the requirements. That will make it easier to mark off tasks or information as you use it. There's a personal preference if you wish to keep the exhibit information open as you go, but please be aware of the tools that that might be hiding, such as the highlight, strike through, calculator, or scratch pad. B1 is clearly a net present value calculation, so set up your spreadsheet accordingly. Clear headings are necessary for organization, professional marks, and it makes it easier for your examiner to give you the marks. After setting up the basic structure to match what we have in the exhibit, we will now begin with sales revenue. A number of these items will have workings, so leave enough space for the net present value calculation to be completed, and then do the workings below. So sales revenue will be working number one, so we set it up accordingly down below. Make sure that you label everything very clearly so the examiner knows exactly what you're trying to do. It'll make it much easier to give you marks and make your professional marks even better. So from the sales revenue, we take, we look at the four years, and we take all the information that you have from your exhibit that's on the left-hand side. Firstly, we start with the units produced and sold. And again, they're directly from the question. So it's 4,300 in year one, up to 25,400 in year four. The second part is your selling price in dollars. And your selling price in dollars starts off at $1,200. But you're also told in the question that this increases by 8% annually as part of inflation. So there's a couple of ways of doing this, but you can be really clever using the Excel. So you start off at 1,200. And if you create a formula such as taking the previous year and multiplying it by 108%, that's adding the 8% each year. And if you copy or drag that across, that computation will already be done for you. One thing that you should keep in mind is formatting throughout. So you need to make sure that all the decimal places are tidied up and make it easier to read, which we'll look at now in a second. And then the sales revenue is clearly just one by the other. So 4,300 multiplied by 1,200. As you notice, we're doing this in thousands of dollars. So when you take the first calculation, you need to divide it by 1,000, and then again you can drag that across. And you can see here how we're selecting the cells and formatting. And you'll see me um, playing around with the formatting throughout to try and make it look the very best as possible. So I think everybody should agree that it's a much better look um, for the examiner to use than it would be um, if you were typing in numbers or you didn't create any formatting. So the advantage with, again, using this spreadsheet is that you shouldn't have to type in answers, you should feed them in. So you should be able to click on the 5160 and drag it across. The most important part of this is if you find out later that you've done some error in your sales revenue calculation, you can adjust it and it'll automatically update everything. So the more you can feed in, the more you can automate, the better. So after sales revenue, we have to look at variables costs and variable costs will be our working number two. Again, an advantage of the spreadsheet, the calculation is quite similar, and even if it isn't, at least use the benefit of the formatting that you've already done. So copy down the sales revenue calculation, make a change to the header to make it clear that it's for variable costs. When calculating your variable costs, the units produced and sold are exactly the same. Instead of a selling price, you have a, a cost. Again, similarly to the selling price, the inflation is 4% per year. So we start off with 484 one year, and as you can see, it's adjusting across. You already have the formula, so just a quick change from 108 to 104 and drag it across. And now that calculation is automatically done for you. Just changing the heading to make sure that it's variable cost and not sales revenue. Again, feeding that in on the variable cost line. If there's an error later, that you notice later on, you can just adjust your working and then it'll automatically correct your net present value calculation. So try and practice this as much as you can and use the formulas at hand. 
The next few items are pretty straightforward. You have fixed cost that has a 10% increase every year. So you start off with your year one of 2,700, um, and then you just, again, create that formula, multiply by 110% every year and drag it across. Next, we have training costs, which are a little bit more complicated in the fact that they change quite regularly. But again, the same principle applies. So you have 200% in the first year, 60% in year two, and 10% in years three and four. That doesn't mean you can't use the formulas that you have done above, or you can keep the same formula. So here we're going to take the initial training cost number that we have, and we know that it's the year one variable cost multiplied by 200%, so it's double that. So you can create the formula for year one using that, and then just drag that across, and then you can adjust each of the formulas to be 60% to be 10% and 10% in the other years. So now that's everything that's required. So now you have your cash flows before tax. So this is just adding your sales revenue less all the additional costs that you've identified. Again, some neat formatting, using the formulas all the time. So you can use a sum formula, or I've just done a very simple way that it's a plus and minus. So it's plus the revenue, less all the costs, giving you your cash flows before tax. The final working required for this question is tax. And there's no mention of tax in what we have from a tax rate perspective, so it talks about the tax level depreciation on the machinery on a 15% straight line basis. But what we need to do is now we need to go back to the exhibits and find some information. So if you've reviewed the exhibits quickly before the exam, you will have noticed that in the additional information, that's where the tax information is provided. And you see that corporation tax rate is 20% per annum. Another thing to notice for later on in the question is the fact that the risk-adjusted cost of capital is 11%, which would be a requirement for when you're discounting the net present value later. So again, if you're setting up another working, why not use the, the at least the layout from the previous questions to start with that? It might be different and you, have to, you might have to make changes, but it's a good way to start. So we're going to do taxation first. So again, remember I talked about using the formulas and that will all update as an error. So the first one you look at are the cash flows before tax. You've already calculated them in your main net present value calculation above. So you should look to drag them down and not to copy in or not to repeat any work that you're already doing. There's no need to calculate anything. There's no need to write it all. You just copy it down and drag it across. The next line we look at is our tax allowable depreciation. Again, we know that the value of the machinery is 35 million. We know it's 15% a year because we have that highlighted above. So it's taking that 35 million multiplied by 15% for each year. And then one last adjustment, the remaining amount of 7 million at the end of year four. So we have to make an adjustment in year four's depreciation for 7 million. Adding up all those numbers gives you your taxable cash flows. And then as we see in the exhibit that we have open on the left hand side, the tax payable is 20%. So now you go back to your main net present value calculation. You set up your tax line, which is working number three. And again, feed in the, the answers that you get from your working below. Now the next thing to consider is our working capital. So you're given some details in the, the question above about working capital and how it'll start off at 20% of sales revenue and in subsequent years will reduce to 10% for every dollar increase. So keep an eye on the formula I'm using here about that 10%, because that's a little bit awkward. You will have come across this many times in exam questions, but using an Excel and practicing using Excel, doing it the quickest way possible is really important. And the quickest way can also be the most accurate way and save you a lot of time in an exam that's very time pressured. So clearly your working capital starts in year zero because we need capital on day one. And that is 20% of year one sales revenue. For year two, then it's a case of taking the difference between year two and year one, which is the dollar value, and multiplying that by 10%. And now at this formula, you can then ca uh, carry over the formula for year two um, and to year three. Remember, the important part of this question is that it also tells you that working capital will be repaid at the end of the project. So the year four working capital has to be the amount of working, the net amount of working capital that has been attributed to the project in year zero to year three. So your total um, 
working capital for the four years is zero. And the final li line needed now is your machinery purchase and sale, which is relatively straightforward. It's 35 million in year zero. That's obviously a negative. And then you know you're receiving 7 million at the end of year four. So now you're calculating your net cash flows, which is an addition of all um, the, the lines above. Now, what, be careful here for year zero. When you're setting up your formula, you have to start with your cash flows before tax and including tax, working capital and machinery. And even though it's blank here, you, if you do that correctly for the first time, then you can copy that across and get a very quick answer. Now that you have your net cash flows, now it's time to calculate your present value. We know again from the exhibit on the left hand side that the rate is 11%. So your present value calculation, obviously year zero doesn't change. Year one is the 3908 divided by 1.11 because the rate is 11%. And again, what you can do is you can be very clever and just calculate all or pull that all the way across and then just change within the calculation. So in year two, it's to the power of two, to the power of three and to the power of four, so on. So again, you're not recreating your calculation every time. You're using this spreadsheet to your advantage. And this will save you a huge amount of time, but practicing this on a number of occasions is really important. So finally then, to calculate your net present value, it's adding all of the present value calculations together. So that will give you an answer of 22,000. Remembering that this is in thousands, so to get a, a, an exact answer, if you multiply the tw negative 22 by 1,000, you will get your, your, full, uh, your full answer. And what you can do then is you can calculate that in. You can replace the text above um, underneath the requirements, and you can just copy in this as an answer, just as a notation later on. So when you're doing your report, you have it available. It's always handy to also to check down, make sure that everything looks good. So the next part we're going to have a look at is Appendix 2. And again, use the headings from above. Don't try and recreate it every single time. It keeps it consistent and you're just copying and pasting and making small changes. So the first thing we're looking at is in Appendix 2 is the GIGU project and, and the asset value. And this covers the, the question on assessing um, the offer from Hanua. So the question is, uh, is how does the, the finance director wants to know how the asset value of $46.1 million has been estimated? And when we look at that asset value, um, we look, it all depends on the future cash flows um, and that related to the future years of the project. And you're given two numbers in the question. You're given a 60 million number and, which, and you're giving, given the 10 million number. And those two numbers added together gives you $70 million. And because you're working backwards, if you multiply that by 1.11, which is the rate we saw earlier, to the power of minus 4, that will bring your number back from 70 million to 46, 111, and so on, a slightly longer number. So that just gives the finance director some um, comfort um, that there is a logic and that the number is being provided um, on a gross basis for the future and make some sense right now. The next part we're going to look at is the Hanua company offer and these are looking at the initial variables used to calculate the D1, D2, the ND1 and the ND2 figures. So first of all to build an asset value we need to look at the cash flows foregone. So the cash flows foregone are those amounts that were included in the present value of cash flows for year three and year four, because remember, we're looking at this offer after year two. And again, you already have those numbers completed, so you should be able to feed those numbers in from above and not have to recalculate anything or retype anything. So there's some other information that we need to have, and a lot of this is in the question. So the exercise price is $30 million. The exercise date is two years. The risk-free rate is the LIBOR rate. That's directly from your exhibits in your question. And then the volatility is 30%. And again, this is the standard deviation provided by UA. So now we look at the value of the Hanua offer. And what you're doing is you're using a lot of the numbers that you have from the question and that you've just calculated. So first of all, it's the call value. And again, you've calculated the call value as being the 
the cash flows for gone, which is the 36 million. Then you have ND1, which is from the question, and it's the 0 0.7821. So the call value multiplied by ND1 is 28, just over 28 million. Then from that, you have to minus the offer, which is 30 million, multiplied by ND2, which is 0 0.6387. And then that's multiplied by e, the exponential, to the power of minus 0 0.023, which is a 2.3% risk-free rate, multiplied by 2, because it's for two years. So in calculating this e, you could use your calculator that you can bring into the exam, and you can also use the calculator that's on the available with your question. Um, but this is just a way, if you use the exp formula, which is the exponential formula, um, and put in the... The calculation afterwards of the minus 0 0.023 multiplied by 2 that will also give you the answer for that. So now to get the final answer is the 28 million minus the 19161 multiplied by the 0.96 and that answer is 10.0081. Now we're going to look at how Hanu's offer is equivalent to a put option. So how to calculate the put value we use the 10081 again you've just calculated so use that number and the value in that if you've realized again if you realize that later on that that there's an error in your calculation if you correct one part of it it'll correct all parts of it in the future so again that's minus the cash flows foregone which again you have earlier plus the 30 million which is the offer multiplied by e to the power of minus 0 0.023 by 2, which we've done earlier as well. So again, all of these numbers you have are from previous in the question. All you have to do is know how to put the calculation together. So to calculate it, it's the 10,081 minus the 36,432 plus the 30 million multiplied by e, which is the 0.96 calculated earlier. And that gives you the 2300.21. So the estimated total value arrives from the two real options. The first is the value of the Jigu project. And the second is the value of Hanua's offer. So you take those two calculations that you've already done and add them together. And you will get your final answer of the estimated total value from the two real options. And then finally, what you can do just to make it all nice and tidy and easier for the examiner, you can tie that in. So replacing the text that you added in earlier, you can just put in some of the solutions directly related to that part of the question. Clearly, you're going to use that in the future when you're going to do your report next. But I think it's good that the examiner know, can tie in exactly what you've done in your spreadsheet below um, to the requirement that you've put in your word processor above. Finally, we move on to the report part of the question. Although you've done a lot of the calculations, this is vitally important part, especially when you get in around uh, professional marks. Um, and it's very keen to, to put it all together for the examiner that not only do you understand the calculations, but you understand the application and the results of those calculations. So every report has a basic structure. Um, like, who is it to? So the report is to the board of directors of Talon Company then what should a report always have? It should have an introduction. And the introduction is key. You're setting the scene um, for the reader about what they're going to find out by reading the report. Then you have two um, parts that are in your requirements. It's an assessment and a discussion of the assumptions. And finally, finishing with a conclusion. For every single report, you should have always have an introduction and a conclusion. And in between, you should split it up in sections that are aligned with the requirements because it makes it much easier to follow, and much easier to answer. So first of all, what do we have to talk about in the, in the introduction? Well, first of all, what did you do? And what's the idea of the report? So as to whether or not that the OER project should be undertaken based on its value. Um, and then the other options from Hanua and Jigu have to be taken into consideration. And then finally, as part of a requirement, you have to have an impact on the assessment. This does not need to be long-winded. It doesn't need to be line after line after line. It's three to four really well-described lines at maximum is all that you need for a good introduction. The next part is moving on to the assessment. Again, you've done all the work in your appendices. 
So you don't have to go through everything again. You don't have to discuss what a net present value calculation is. You just want to effectively give them the results. So the things you want to highlight here are that the, the initial net present value is a negative, albeit a small negative, of $22,000. And again, highlight the fact that where that's covered in, so that's covered in Appendix 1. So that's already done. Um, you should indicate whether or not the project is pr worth pursuing or not, which under net present value rules, you would say no, although it is very marginal. Um, then you assess the offer from Hanua and the Jigu project using the real options method, showing that you have an estimated value of over $17 million. And again, highlight that that's in Appendix 2, which is very positive and, and substantial. Um, and finally, you should give a, a decision. So your final decision is that you would indicate that the OUYA project should be undertaken based on the calculations and the assessment you've made. So now we move on to the assumptions section. And um, I think if you were reading through the question and looking at the report, uh, the, the introduction is about the calculations you've made and then your assessment is all based on that. The assumptions are quite a big part of the report. So one thing that I would sometimes do, and again, it's personal preference and you will learn through practice, is I would put any of the assumptions I have very quickly in a, in a kind of a list, and then I'd go back and expand on them. Obviously, you can discuss what in each in full detail as you wish going through it. That's really a personal preference. So some of the assumptions that we want to look at here is about using the Hanua's acid beta to provide a good approximation of the value of Ouya. Um, looking at whether the variable, variables provided are accurate and reasonable. Um, we need to look at the black skills option pricing model used um, and recognize the fact that it's not usual for physical products. Um, we also look at the black skulls model and we assume that, that assumes volatility or risk can be determined accurately and readily, which is not always the case. Also, the model includes that it's a European style option. Um, in reality, it's more likely to be a US style option. Um, real options assume contracted obligations are binding. And again, we don't foresee that this is going to be the case here. And also the, the Black Skulls option pricing model does not take account of management behavior in decision making, which is a key point. So first we would take those, those key assumptions and then you could go back just like I've done here, although it's quite speeded up, uh, and you can just complete that section of the report. Finally, then we come to the conclusion. And the conclusion is a key role for the report. It pulls everything together. It gets across the point of any of the learnings you have, you have. So what are the key points to raise in the conclusion when you're talking about this project? So the initial recommendation is that the OUYA project should be undertaken when the offer from Hanua and going ahead with the Jigu project are included. So taken together, I think we've proven already that they result in a significant net present value. However, you have to be wary that any of the assumptions we raised above, that they might change things. So if the assumptions are incorrect, it might have an impact on the overall values that are calculated um, and therefore change your decision. So realistically, this is more of an indicative value um, which can be attached to maybe a choice of future actions, um, but it certainly does indicate that it should be undertaken. And I think if you have a combination of um, this report and all the calculations below, well presented, good formatting, you don't need amazing colors, you don't need to underline everything, you don't need to make it unnecessarily complicated, but if you take this approach, you could be very successful in doing your AFM exam.